pure, white, and deadly. How Sugar is Killing Us and What We Can Do to Stop It by John Yudkin Prophecy and Propaganda Introduction to the 2012 edition by Robert H. Lustig, M.D. Everything old is new again. Take fashion, for example. Bell-bottoms, culottes, mini-skirts, wedge heels, thin ties, and fancy lingerie are back. A silent film won the Oscar for Best Picture in 2012. The bubblegum rock band ABBA and swing dancing are in vogue again. Speciality cocktails are making a comeback. Martinis are the rage, and now there are 80 varieties. Even phonographs and vinyl LPs have a new following. Ideas come and go as well. Someone is always on the cutting edge. The argument seems inescapable. It gains a following, sometimes a bit too zealous a following. Then it falls out of fashion, sometimes due to philosophy, sometimes to experience, sometimes to competing world events, and sometimes to dark forces attempting to maintain the status quo for their own purposes. But science should be based in facts, not fashion, and policy should be based on science. Facts shouldn't change, and indeed they don't, but their interpretation does. Consider the idea that inflammation causes heart disease. First espoused in the late 1800s after the invention of aspirin by Bayer, this idea was relegated to the dustbin of medical science in favor of the cholesterol hypothesis, which reigned for the second half of the 20th century. But over the last decade, the inflammation hypothesis has made a decided comeback and is now thought to be the primary factor in the genesis of atherosclerotic plaques and thrombosis. Sadly, interpretation of medical science is frequently influenced by the dark forces of industry, out to make a killing. And when there is money to be made, there will be big winners, but also big losers, including those killed. Witness the tobacco debacle. The risks of smoking have been known since the 1930s. The U.S. Surgeon General Report of 1964 squarely faced down the tobacco industry. That put the tobacco propaganda machine into overdrive to squelch the science and any scientists who stood in their way. My colleague at the University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Stanton Glantz, was, and to this day still is, public enemy number one of the tobacco industry. For twenty-five years he was a prophet in the wilderness. Stan warned about Big Tobacco's tactics at every level. The political buy-offs, the marketing, the advertising to children, product placement in movies. He even uncovered blatant fabrication of data by the industry to exonerate their product. What did it get him? Twenty-five years of constant battles, both in the courtroom and in the court of public opinion. He was painted as a false prophet, a zealot. But Stan had the courage of his convictions. More importantly, he had the data. Of course he was, and still is, right on target. Indeed, who determines the difference between a prophet and a heretic? Whoever gets to write the history. It's only with our retrospectroscope that we seem to have 2020 vision. Ask Galileo. And so it is with Dr. John Yudkin. Let's set the stage. In 1955, President Eisenhower experienced a heart attack while in office. The issue of heart disease and its prevention was thrust into public consciousness. What component of diet caused heart disease? This was the seminal issue in public health disputed in academic circles and the media throughout the 1960s and 1970s. Two factions sprang up. Dr. Yudkin was a University of London physiologist, nutritionist and physician, and the primary exponent for the idea that sugar was the dietary factor promoting heart disease, and several others as well. 
first published in 1972 and updated with new science in 1986, Pure, White and Deadly was, is and remains a prophecy. Yudkin foresaw the sugar glut that ultimately arrived with the advent of high-fructose corn syrup. He preached in the wilderness, and no one listened. In the other corner, Ansel Keyes was a University of Minnesota epidemiologist who, in 1953, first espoused the argument that saturated fat was the primary cause of heart disease, culminating with his volume, Seven Countries, A Multivariate Analysis of Death and Coronary Heart Disease, Harvard University Press, Cambridge, 1980. The debate grew beyond the academic. The rancor got up close and personal, with Keyes declaring in 1971, It is clear that Yudkin has no theoretical basis or experimental evidence to support his claim for a major influence of dietary sucrose in the etiology of coronary heart disease. His claim that men who have CHD are excessive sugar eaters is nowhere confirmed but is disproved by many studies superior in methodology and or magnitude to his own, and his evidence from population statistics and time trends will not bear up under the most elementary critical examination. Three scientific findings of the 1970s undid Yudkin's case and sealed his fate. Firstly, by studying the genetic disease, familial hypercholesterolemia, Victims experience heart attacks as early as 18 years old. Michael Brown and Joseph Goldstein discovered low-density lipoproteins, LDL, and the LDL receptor, which won them the Nobel Prize, leading to the hypothesis that LDL was the bad actor in heart disease. Secondly, dietary studies showed that dietary fat raised LDL levels. Thirdly, Large epidemiological studies showed that LDL levels correlated with heart disease in populations. Slam dunk, right? It's the fat, stupid. The Pharisees of this nutritional holy war declared Keyes the victor, Yudkin a heretic and a zealot, threw the now discredited Yudkin under the proverbial bus and relegated his pivotal work to the dustbin of history as this book went out of print and virtually disappeared from the scene. The propaganda of low fat as the treatment for heart disease was perpetuated for the next 30 years, and the cluster of diseases, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, lipid problems, heart disease, collectively termed the metabolic syndrome, increased in a parabolic fashion under the canopy of the sugar industry and their propaganda machine. But good ideas die hard. Larger studies started to demonstrate that serum triglyceride levels correlated with heart disease, with sugar consumption being the primary driver. And there wasn't one type of LDL, there were two. Large buoyant LDL, driven by dietary fat, but which was neutral in terms of heart disease, and small, dense LDL, driven by dietary carbohydrate, and which oxidizes quickly, driving atherosclerotic plaque formation, hardening of the arteries. The Atkins diet was now being taken seriously. Carbohydrates started to assume center stage in promoting metabolic disease with sugar consumption implicated as the most notorious carbohydrate. I stumbled upon Dr. Yudkin quite by accident in 2008. I was in Adelaide, Australia, giving a talk at the Australasian Association of Clinical Biochemists on my research into the role of sugar in the pathogenesis of metabolic syndrome. Dr. Leslie Bennett said to me, "'Surely you've read Yudkin.' and I admitted I hadn't. When I got home, I looked for Pure, White and Deadly and couldn't find it in our UCSF library or in any bookstore in San Francisco. Eventually, I got it by interlibrary loan. I opened the book, and it opened my eyes. 
I already knew from my own work that sugar at our current rate of consumption is a medical disaster. But to learn that Yudkin foresaw what a problem sugar was 36 years earlier and at a much lower dose, i.e. before the advent of high-fructose corn syrup and the two-litre bottle, was a true revelation. Indeed, I was a Yudkin disciple and I hadn't even realised it. Yudkin didn't have the voluminous data that exists today. He had correlation, but not causation. He didn't have mechanism. He didn't know that sugar caused insulin resistance by being turned into fat in the liver through the process of de novo lipogenesis, or that sugar induced protein damage through the Maillard or Browning reaction. He didn't know that sugar was weakly addictive, although he surmised it. Despite that, pure, white and deadly draws direct lines between sugar and dental caries, gout, autoimmune disease, heart disease and cancer. Indeed, it shows that sugar consumption and mortality rates go hand in hand. In the face of the current science and nutrition explosion and the fall of the low-fat hypothesis, Penguin Books UK has chosen to reissue this old book, which is new again. We are now almost 27 years removed from Dr. Yudkin's 1986 update. Surely, with all we've learned, this book must now be obsolete, isn't it? Not at all. First of all, true prophecies don't go out of style. That's like saying Darwin's origin of the species is irrelevant because Darwin didn't know what genes were. Secondly, it is a signpost on a journey of pilgrimage. It provides you with perspective on where you've come from and where you're going. And lastly, Yudkin correctly fingered the sugar and food industries for what they were and still are. Those who don't understand history are condemned to repeat it especially in the face of persistent propaganda. And this book is history. I'm proud to be a Yudkin disciple, to contribute to resurrecting his work and his reputation, and to assist in the advancement of his legacy and public health message. Every scientist stands on the shoulders of giants. For a man of relatively diminutive stature and build, Dr. John Yudkin was indeed a giant. Introduction to the 1986 edition A great deal has been written about sugar. There are dozens of books about the cultivation of the sugar cane and the sugar beet, including books that describe the shameful story of the slave trade between Europe, West Africa and the Caribbean. There are dozens of books giving the technical details of sugar refining and the manufacture of sugar-containing food and drinks but further accurate information about sugar as a food is not easy to come by. How many people eat more than average and how many people eat less? Who are the small consumers and who are the big consumers? And what are the smallest and largest amounts consumed? What would it do to our health if we took no sugar at all or if we ate quite large amounts? Part of this information can, with some trouble, be found in trade publications, but not all of it. You might think you could get it from the sugar industry itself. They undoubtedly have active information centres in many countries. We know what the average sugar consumption is in each country. But it is not possible to get the answer even to such simple questions as how much sugar is in the diets of people of different ages or what is the range of the sugar content of the diet of 15-year-old British schoolchildren. It may be that the industry simply does not have this information, or it may be that they have it, but do not wish it to be known. Especially, we would expect the sugar industry to be knowledgeable about levels of consumption when, in rejecting criticisms of the effects on health, they constantly refer to moderate consumption. Yet what the industry considers moderate must, on any reckoning, be quite a sizable quantity. One of the scientists who most strongly supports the sugar industry has written, 
The usual range of sugar intake may therefore be between 10 and 30 percent of total calories, with the average at 15 to 20 percent. He goes on to say, This rate of sugar intake may be considered moderate and can probably be exceeded somewhat without overstepping the balance of moderation. Much more research has been done on the effects on health of the bread in our diet, or the eggs or the breakfast cereals, or the meat, or the vegetables, than about the effects of sugar, even though sugar, on average, constitutes about 17% of our diet, a larger proportion than any of these other items. Yet in 1972, when Pure, White and Deadly was first published, what little research there had been already showed that sugar in our diet might be involved in the production of several conditions, including not only tooth decay and overweight, but also diabetes and heart disease. Since that time, research has produced further evidence that sugar is implicated in these conditions, and has also added to the list of diseases in which the sugar we eat may possibly, or even probably, be a factor. Many of the experiments from which these conclusions are derived have been carried out at the Nutrition Department of Queen Elizabeth College, University of London, some of them in collaboration with research workers in the Biochemistry Department. When our experiments have been repeated independently in other research institutes, the results have always been in line with our own. Those who disagree with what we say may therefore challenge the conclusions that we draw from the research, but they cannot legitimately disagree with the experimental results. In this edition, I have taken the opportunity to bring up to date and extend many of the statistics that I quoted earlier. I have also summarized the research that we and others have done during the last 14 or 15 years which has shown more of what happens in our bodies when we eat sugar. I am often asked why we don't hear very much about the dangers of sugar, while we are constantly being told we have too much fat in our diet and not enough fiber. I suggest that you will find at least part of the answer in the last chapter of this book. John Yudkin, 1979-1980